Hi, this is Matt McCormick at the Department of Philosophy, California State University, Sacramento. My email address is mccormick at csus.edu, and the bottom address there is my course website page. Today we're going to talk about uh, an introduction to the problem of evil, a classic problem in the philosophy of religion. All right, so what's the basic problem of evil that has been discussed in these contexts for uh, philosophers of religion for the last 2,000 years or so? Uh, the problem is that all of these claims are alleged to be true. God exists. God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent, but there's also evil. Now, we've got a lot more to say about what that means. Um, let's define evil as apparently unnecessary or pointless suffering. So if you look at the dictionary, this is the third most uh, frequently used definition, that which is morally wrong or bad, immoral, wicked, evil deeds, and evil life. That's the definition you're probably most useful uh, used to. But the third here fits our account better. Uh, that which is characterized or accompanied by misfortune or suffering, unfortunate, disastrous, to be fallen on evil days. Uh, so reflect for a moment here on how the term evil is being used. This is a little bit uh, unusual. Uh, this has been the custom in philosophy of religion to talk about it this way, but in your uh, experience, you probably think of evil slightly differently. Here's what we mean. The problem of, e of evil is really the problem of suffering. Our tendency is to think of the term evil as indicating only those actions that arise from a deliberate or malicious human intent. So somebody's trying to perpetrate evil in the world. Uh, but that's not what we mean. We need to train ourselves from the tendency to think of evil as only being of this type. The problem for the theological views that we're considering in this course is that there's a lot of suffering in the world. That is to say, on many people's accounts, or at least uh, prima facie, it appears that there's more suffering than we might expect if there's a good being of great power out there that exists. Um, so think of it this way. The problem is greater than just moral evil, which is the kind of malicious, deliberate, intentional evil we were just talking about. The problem is that good beings generally seek to eliminate unnecessary suffering, whatever its source. So Bill Gates here is, a, is offering up $24 billion to eradicate disease in Africa, which doesn't come from anybody's malicious intent. Or George Clooney here is raising money for earthquake victims for Haiti because they're suffering or Martin Luther King is seeking to eliminate injustice, um, which of course uh, arises from ignorance and prejudice uh, during the civil rights movement of people who, uh, people who were deliberately, maliciously uh, mistreating um, African Americans. So some suffering in the world arises from malicious human intent, but some arises inadvertently from human action, and some arises from natural causes. So we're talking about all of those sources of suffering, and it would appear, at least prima facie, that a good being, if, uh, Bill, uh, sorry, if Bill Gates here or Martin Luther King or uh, George Clooney can be considered to be you know, possessing some level of goodness or virtue in that they're trying to alleviate the suffering, a good being tries to get rid of it insofar as they can. Um, that's why we hold Martin Luther King in such high esteem. Um, so let's make a finer distinction here between natural evil, which is pointless suffering that is caused by natural events or disasters such as floods, famine, disease, earthquakes, etc. There's no real malicious intent in these cases, but there's a great deal of suffering that gets produced. And then there's also moral evil, and this is pointless suffering that's inflicted by people and animals by the actions of humans. Now, some of this is deliberate and has malicious intent, but some of this is deliberate with good intentions. Sometimes people um, are trying to do good, and they mess up, and they actually cause a lot of harm. Or um, sometimes they're trying to do something else, but they uh, inadvertently uh, cause uh, great suffering. And sometimes there's just accidental cases. So... Um, by th through no malicious intent whatsoever, uh, somebody makes a choice and they act and the result of that uh, action then produces a great deal of suffering in some human or non-human animals. Okay, so that leads us to another set of distinctions we should make. So we're dividing up evil into 
uh, natural and moral evil uh, categories, but we can also divide the pie up this uh, by way of these four distinctions. There's cases where uh, humans inflict suffering intentionally or unintentionally on other humans. That's HH in my grid here. There's human on animal suffering where human actions produce suffering in animals. Um, and then there's nature that inflicts uh, suffering on humans and nature that inflicts suffering on animals. So the top two here are uh, moral evil categories. The bottom two are natural evil categories. And then within those uh, uh, cases, there are different examples, different cases, human and non-human. Okay, so now who on the receiving side, who's capable of suffering? Well, the natural and obvious point is, to, is that humans obviously suffer, but we should broaden the category here because uh, philosophy Philosophers have long known, neuroscientists, biologists have long known that sentience is the capacity to experience pain. So in this context, we're going to define sentience as m this very low uh, threshold uh, category. It's just the ability to feel pain. Pain receptive neurons are common in the animal kingdom. Some of the spinal cord and brain structures associated with pain are present in lots of animals, and they're very simple structures. So uh, the brains of lots of different monkeys, cats, ferrets, rats, and humans have all um, got these basic structures, so we can conclude with some um, high degree of confidence that, lo that there are lots more uh, uh, beings who are capable of experiencing pain than just hum humans. And that's why when this wolf gets its leg caught in a trap, um, neurologically, uh, ner in terms of its nervous system, uh, a great deal of what's going on there is similar to what's going on with the human who uh, gets their leg caught in a trap or uh, is otherwise injured. Uh, okay, now the circle here of sentience might go much further than you thought. Um, here's a quote from a, an article that's linked here uh, on the page. There is evidence from some species of fish, cephalopods, decapod, crustaceans of substantial perceptual ability, pain and adrenal systems, emotional responses, long and short-term memory, complex cognition, individual differences, deception, tool use, and social learning. The case for protecting these animals would appear to be substantial. And this is in part, uh, largely in part, of because of their capacity to experience pain. Um, so when you look at clinical trials, for instance, or when you look at scientific research, um, octopi and um, uh, other um, cephalopods will uh, sometimes get uh, uh, consideration or restriction in terms of what uh, scientists and researchers can do to them because of it looks like they've got a capacity to experience some form of pain. All right, so that means the circle here of sentient beings that deserve at least some consideration when we're trying to just determine how big is the problem of suffering and what sort of answers might be reasonable to accept in terms of solving the problem of suffering, the circle here is much bigger than you might have thought. It's not just about humans. Um, now, one way to think about this is also to ask this question, how far back in history does suffering go? Well, those neural structures probably started emerging somewhere around here hundreds of millions of years ago. So way back in the evolutionary tree, uh, humans, of course, occupied the tiniest little branch of the bottom right corner of this whole diagram. But if you go back several um, uh, a million years, several tens of millions years uh, back, maybe hundreds of millions back, um, we start seeing the uh, evidence that the neural structures that are pr uh, produce uh, sentience or that produce a capacity to experience pain emerge there. Now that also means way over on the far uh, left bottom corner, bacteria don't have the nervous systems, don't have to worry about them. Uh, so when you're using uh, Lysol to clean up the uh, kitchen um, uh, counter and you're annihilating uh, millions and millions of bacteria. Uh, you don't need to worry about your contributing to the massive amounts of suffering into the world because they just don't have the nervous systems for it. Okay, so that means that for millions of years and there, there have been billions of sentient organisms, this tree, now that we're zooming in, shows only the tiniest skeleton, um, only the, the sort of vaguest amount of detail here. We're actually talking about billions of sentient organisms over the course of evolutionary history. And pain, suffering, and death are the machinery of natural selection. That's how natural selection and evolution happened. Evolution is, in effect, a history of pain. Human suffering is a relatively recent and tiny minority of the total. Like I said, only the tiniest little branch down there in the bottom right corner. 
Uh, so even dinosaur pain uh, is worth thinking about to some extent in this discussion. Uh, what uh, should we think about God and his relationship to dinosaur pain? There's some suffering in the world, and a good being would try to eliminate suffering insofar as they're, they're able. So why um, would God tolerate uh, dinosaur pain? Now, maybe you're not worried about that much, but it's a, it's a worthy and interesting question to think about here. And we've got to wonder here in what follows, uh, we're going to look at some of the classic and really influential answers to the problem of suffering where people have tried to construct a, a, an account, a scenario whereby God might have allowed or permitted or even caused some of the suffering in the world. So we've got a, a taxonomy now here of different kinds of suffering, and we've got a rough uh, idea of some of the highlights or some of the uh, important aspects of the history of suffering. Uh, all of those are going to need to be taken into account. Okay, so examples of moral evil. These are not hard to come by. Joseph Stalin, of course, in the beginning of the Soviet Union, is said to have tortured and killed as many as 20 million people in the purges of political distance in the Soviet Union. Hitler in the Third Reich tortured and killed as many as 10 million Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, and other enemies of the state. And you know lots of examples, or you've heard lots of the, the uh, gory details of how that was uh, perpetrated. Was there malicious intent in these cases? Mm, hard to know. Hitler probably thought, mistakenly, that he was acting for the benefit of the human race, maybe in some, uh, uh, some of the dark, deep depths of the perversions of his uh, conception of what ultimately he thought would be good for humanity. He thought that what he was doing was a good thing. Uh, I, I don't know. We don't need to settle that question uh, because pretty clearly we can say even if he thought he was doing a good thing, um, he uh, did. He wasn't actually doing a good thing. So there should be, we've we got to keep this cl clear difference in mind between whether or not somebody thinks they're doing good and whether they're actually doing, doing good in the world. And pretty clearly, by any reasonable account, Hitler was not doing good <clears throat> in the world. Human actions sometimes produce accidents that lead to great suffering <clears throat> without any malicious intent. So uh, we can think about examples like thalidomide or chemical spills or nuclear accidents where there was no uh, malicious intent or something um, happened inadvertently and it ends up producing suffering, but there wasn't any intent. Those are still examples of moral evil because they're human caused. Okay, now natural evil. What are some examples of those? Well, there's a the famous tsunami in Thailand uh, happened around Christmas in 1996. Uh, I've got the date right on, wrong on that. Um, that tsunami killed uh, approximately 237,000 people. Many times that were made homeless, lost loved ones, and suffering uh, suffered staggering losses. So this enormous wave, tidal wave caused by uh, an earthquake off the coast of Thailand swept in and just wiped out all these coastal, coastal regions. No human uh, action here produced this uh, event, yet it cre created massive amounts of human and non-human suffering. In the Middle Ages, in the middle 1300s, uh, the bubonic plague wiped out as much as 60 percent of the population of Europe. Cholera, typhoid, polio, cancer, lots of other examples of natural evil producing enormous amounts of uh, pain and suffering in the course of human and non-human history on the planet. Okay, so the question of course is what is God's relationship to all of this evil? Uh, God is omniscient, so God knows about the existence of evil. God is omnipotent, so he has the power to eliminate evil. He can do anything right. God is omnibenevolent, so it would appear that he has the desire to el el eliminate evil. That's the basic problem. And now we've got some of the uh, sort of essential or important conceptual distinctions in place to understand um, ways in which we might go about answering this problem. Okay, so what? Uh, just as a first pass, and we're going to dive into this in much more detail over the following weeks, but as a first pass, uh, what are some of the common reactions that people have to this uh, basic problem? Well, uh, one of the most famous and most influential, influential and most important answers comes from John Hick. We're going to read Hick next. And Hick argues that suffering builds moral character. Uh, Hick's view is that God permits suffering, both uh, moral evil and natural evil, because of what it accomplishes. It uh, provides opportunities for people to grow in moral responsibility, to learn to govern and improve their own ac activities, or to endure uh, suffering and develop strength of character uh, themselves. Uh, a good humor, long-suffering, uh, um, strength of character, 
generosity, charity, and a lot of the other important virtues. And Hick's argument is that God allows it so that we become better people, and that's the best way to achieve that outcome. Leibniz, who we're also going to look at, argues that we can't understand the greater good in the divine plan that suffering at the local level may produce. We're too small. Our perspective on the grand scheme of things is too limited. We understand too little to really understand what's going on here. So even though it looks like ultimately it's not worth it, in fact, from the divine perspective, it might uh, be uh, worth it. So we have to be agnostic or suspend judgment or trust uh, that uh, God in his omniscience understands things and has a plan for all of this. Uh, Planiga, who we're also going to look at, uh, gives a, a famous answer called the free will defense. And he argues that the benefits of our having freedom outweigh, in God's eyes, the disvalue of the moral evil that we produce with it. So we're free to make choices uh, with our actions. We can go do good in the world or we can go do evil, and God lets us do that because that freedom itself is such a valuable uh, uh, thing to have in the world and in the universe. This is a different position than just what Hick was arguing before, but we'll talk about that later when we look at Hick in more detail. Uh, Rowe, William Rowe, who we're also going to look at, just argues that there's no God. The answer to the problem of evil is to conclude that there's no such being. There is no being who has all of those properties because it just doesn't make sense that somebody has all power, all knowledge, and all goodness, and yet there is so much evil. So Rowe solves the problem uh, by eliminating God from the equation. The other authors that we just considered, Hick, Leibniz, and Planiga, keep God in the equation and say if we add in in this justification or add in this detail, then we can reconcile God's existence with all the suffering in the world. There's a number of other common responses that we're not going to consider in detail uh, because of limits in time. Um, many times people will say, well, good cannot exist without evil. Not even an omnipotent God can create a world with one and not the other. Uh, now, this view is problematic because uh, very commonly the theist also wants to say that God is all-powerful. God can do anything. So it would appear that if God can do anything, then why can't he create good without evil? And those two Seem, those two things don't seem to, to uh, sit well with each other. That is to say, in the first sentence, uh, this theist says, well, good can't exist without evil. Well, the cannot exist there is a limit you're putting on God. You're saying not even God can create a world without one, um, uh, with one and not with, uh, without, without the other. God uh, eliminating evil is beyond God's power. And that doesn't sit well with lots of people who also want to say that God's all-powerful. So um, that, uh, that line of reasoning, while there might be some potential down there looks like there's a big challenge to deal with um, once we get down into the details. Uh, many people often say, and this is a different point, we need evil in order to understand goodness. And this is a point about us. Humans have to have some suffering in order to understand goodness. But again, one of the problems with this kind of response is that God is alleged to be all-powerful. God can do anything. So why is it he can't create humans who understand evil without inflicting genocide and cancer on them? Why is it we have to have so much? Or why is it that a God with all power can't create us with some expanded understanding that doesn't include our needing to uh, endure leukemia, for example? So uh, this claim about we need evil in order to understand goodness has to be understood as a limit on God again, and that seems to be um, a bit problematic for some theistic positions. Uh, sometimes people will say, well, Satan's responsible for all this suffering in the world. But again, uh, there's this question that uh, critics, people like Roe, will come back and ask, but wait a minute, again, inserting Satan into the equation doesn't solve the problem. It just removes it and, and, and creates sort of the problem of Satan's evil. God's all power. Powerful. So are you suggesting that his power doesn't extend over Satan as well? Why is it that God allows Satan to perpetrate all this suffering on the world? Got the same problem. Satan doesn't solve the problem just yet. So there's a great deal more that needs to be said unless you want to give up this notion that God's all powerful. Sometimes people will say, well, evil isn't real. It's just a human construct. It's just the way we see things. It's not a real thing. It's just our preferences. Um, but now I want to fall back to the original distinction we made about the difference between uh, moral evil and suffering. We're really talking about the suffering, uh, the problem of suffering. And there really seems to be, it's not reasonable to suggest that there's no suffering in the world. Suffering's a real thing. Um, the Holocaust really was evil. It really did produce suffering. We've got abundant evidence of that. And we know what it does to human nervous systems for them to starve or them to be... Uh, uh, um, 
uh, you know, uh, get typhoid or to get cholera. Uh, child sex abuse really does cause pain, cause, cause suffering. It's not a human construct. What that's doing neurologically, psychologically, sociologically to a to a human being. So um, the the answer that evil isn't real doesn't seem to be uh, genuinely addressing the bigger problem of suffering here. Um, sometimes people will say, oh, well, it's not God's fault. God's out of the picture. Uh, they'll adopt a kind of deism view. God set up the universe to run on its course, and then he pressed the start button. He let it unfold without interference. Um, so the universe is a sort of vast machine that unfolds according to its own principles, and God's not there. It's not God's fault. But, but again, this doesn't seem to really solve the problem. Um, good beings don't turn their backs on suffering that they could have easily prevented. I mean, if I set up a, um, uh, a remote control or an autonomous tank and I uh, hit the start button and then I unleash it to go plowing through a village and it plows over lots of uh, huts in the village and kills and maims lots of people in the process. But as soon as I hit the start button on this elaborate machinery that I set loose on the village, I left town. Um, um, I got out of the picture. You wouldn't say, oh, well, that absolves me of moral responsibility for wiping out all the people in the village or causing all this suffering. Um, the, the, setting up some system that then produces pain and then leaving uh, the picture doesn't absolve you of moral responsibility or it doesn't suggest that you're infinitely morally good. So the God is out of the picture response doesn't seem to be immediately very fruitful for solving the problem. And, and all of these problems are, are partly why we're not going to spend a lot of time in this course really pursuing them. We're going to look at those others, the ones on the previous slide in more detail. Uh, okay, now let me make another distinction. Philosophers understand um, the problem of suffering two different ways. There's a logical problem and there's an inductive problem. Here's the logical problem. The logical problem of suffering is to say that it's not logically possible for both God and co evil to coexist. And that's to say, a being such as God cannot coexist with suffering any more than a triangle can have five sides. Um, God and evil are logically contradictory. Uh, so some people like J.L. Mackey and some others have argued this point. Um, so a theodicy that is responsible, and a theodicy is an answer to uh, the logical uh, to a log to a problem of evil that reconciles God's existence. So a, a theodicy that would respond to the logical problem only needs, needs to argue that it is possible for God and and evil to coexist. Um, so the logical problem. Uh, problem of evil atheist, for example, somebody like J.L. Mackey would say that God and evil are logically impossible to have uh, to exist together. Evil does exist, so God must not. People who offer theodicies to reconcile or to answer this kind of challenge to theism would have to argue that it's possible that God does exist. And here's what I mean by the difference, um, and you know, so this will become clearer in the next few minutes. Consider the difference between arguing that it's possible that Bigfoot exists and proving that, in fact, Bigfoot uh, is actually real. Mere possibilities are very different than actualities. It's a much easier to um, argue in favor of a possibility than to argue um, in favor of something's actually happening. Um, if I argue that it's possible you'll be struck by lightning today, um, that's easier to demonstrate or easier to convince somebody of than arguing that you actually will be struck by lightning today. Planning as free will defense is widely thought to have answered the logical problem of evil. He argues that it's possible that God values freedom and that the moral evil that results is unavoidable. So that gets God off the hook for the logical problem. Now, the evidential problem is stated differently. It, uh, people like William Rowe will argue that given what we know about suffering, it doesn't seem reasonable to think, it doesn't seem probable or likely uh, to think that God, that an omni-God exists, an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good God exists. So Rowe, Rowe doesn't say that God's impossible. He just says, given that there's suffering out there, it seems unlikely or unreasonable to think that um reign or that uh, God uh, exists in that context. And what I mean by that is uh, consider a, a meteorologist who argues, well, it's very probable that it's going to rain today given the conditions. It's a 95% chance it's going to rain today. Um, and that's expressed in a great deal of confidence without saying that I've proven that it's uh, impossible that it won't rain or that it's certain that it will rain. 
And that's more like Rowe's uh, more modest position here about the uh, question of, of God's existence and suffering. Answering the evidential challenge is harder for the theist. Theodicies that respond to an argument like Rose are much more challenging. Um, this theodicist, this theist, must successfully argue that it's probable that God and evil coexist, that God's existence is probable in the, in the face of, uh, of suffering. And this is going to become more uh, clear in the next few weeks. Uh, but this is partly why when Rowe published his famous article in the 70s, it's produced so much response and has still created so much debate in the philosophy of religion is because this is a really hard argument to, a to easily answer. And it's been very uh, a very stimulating and very live time in uh, uh, the philosophy of religion. So again, consider the difference between arguing that Bigfoot is possible uh, versus giving compelling evidence that Bigfoot is real. Much harder to argue that God is actually real real, given the evidence, says Roe, um, than merely arguing that God is possible. Roe will grant that it's possible that God exists. It just doesn't seem reasonable to believe it's true. Okay, so um, let's think about generally um, some other challenges to theism that the problem of evil presents. And this is not to say that these can't be answered. There's lots of interesting attempts to answer them, but I'm trying to lay out the landscape here and the concepts that will uh, inform our discussion and inform our reading and studying lots of these more uh, sophisticated answers. The principal challenge to theism is to reconcile God and evil one way or another. That is, for the theist, what is needed is some explanation that gets God off the hook for all this suffering. If there were some justification for why God would tolerate evil, then we might have a way to resolve this apparent incompatibility. Now, here's an important distinction. I've already hinted at it, but let me just reemphasize it. Um, consider the sentence A. It's possible that God permits or brings about suffering S in order to achieve some outcome O. That's one sentence that the theist might argue for. Versus somebody else might argue for B, we know or have good reason to believe that God permits, brings about suffering S in order to achieve outcome O. Now that's going to be a very important distinction to keep in mind in the discussions that follow. You should ask yourself, what is Leibniz arguing here? What is Planiga arguing here? What is Hick arguing here? What is Rowe arguing here? Is he arguing for the possibility claim or arguing for the um, we know or have good reason to believe claim? And what what kind of evidence would be required to prove A or B? Because if you thought A was true, if you had reasons to think A were true, well, that might entitle you to say that, therefore, I'm not sure whether some case of suffering is pointless. Since it's possible that uh, the free will defense is true, then maybe this case of suffering is not pointless. Now, that's a, a more modest position that somebody might defend instead of somebody who then says something stronger. Somebody says, well, we know, we have good reason to believe that God permits or brings about suffering S in order to, to achieve outcome O. And if you knew that, then that might entitle you to say that I know that S is not pointless. And that's a much harder thing to argue for. And we could ask ourselves, which one is somebody offering? Um, when your priest or pastor or rabbi or imam is giving an explanation of suffering, um, uh, you know, during your religious service, which one of these claims is is he or she defending? What are they trying to argue for? What are you trying to argue for when you're thinking about the the role or the purpose or the function of suffering in the world? Okay, some other ways to think about the challenges for the Odysseys. Um, now, sometimes theodicies will argue that there are some goods that come from some evils. It's true that um, an abducted child uh, out there in the community might lead to generosity and compassion from the community. Somebody might say, well, sure, the abduction of this kid was awful, but as a result, we got um, Megan's Law as a result that produces far more good um, than that, uh, that isolated case or that limited case of suffering. Now, the problem is that when we point out these upsides of some horrible event in the world, that by itself is not enough to justify the evil necessarily. And here's why. And this requires some, some difficult uh, sort of conceptual movement here. But think about it this way. Consider a parallel example. Imagine the doctor had a complete cure for your cancer, 
but the doctor didn't tell you and just gave you something to alleviate some of your pain. So some good came of the cure. Um, you felt better than you did before, so there's some improvement. But in that result, if the doctor still had a complete cure for your cancer, but just gave you a modest um, uh, uh, alleviation of some of your pain, you wouldn't conclude that that doctor had done the best thing or done the smartest thing. That is to say, uh, here's another example. The Nazis built a great highway system, after all. There were some good things that came out of um, the uh, Third Reich and what they did during the 30s and 40s in Germany. Uh, and we can say that because, of course, um, there may have been some limited good things, but then the bigger picture, the point is that some goods are not worth the evils that produce them. You wouldn't say, oh, well, since we got this great highway system, then it was worth it in the big picture. Nobody thinks that, right? Nobody thinks the Holocaust um, was sufficient uh, to, or that the benefits here were sufficient to justify the Holocaust. So the mere fact that we can come up with some goods that are produced by an evil is not enough to absolve it or to justify it or to vindicate um, the person who might be responsible or the person who might have been able to prevent it in the first place. And that's a really important and really, uh, in some cases, painful question to think about in these contexts. The mere fact that some good comes out of it is not enough to give us some uh, solution or to reconcile God and that evil in the world. Okay, now here's another way to think of it. Sometimes a greater good comes from an evil. Um, sometimes there's, a, the, there's an evil event, but then a greater good comes out of it. So think of the uh, Ar Lance Armstrong example. Somebody selfish contracts cancer, narrowly survives, and then changes his life for the betterment of humanity. And he becomes a much better person, and he does all this remarkable stuff with the Live, uh, Live Strong Foundation and all this cancer research. So the bad thing, the cancer, ends up producing um, a much greater good overall. Again, here's the problem. By itself, this might not be enough to justify it from the big, pers the big perspective, from the grand the divine perspective. Um, consider another parallel example. Suppose a doctor has two cures, and in my analogies here, um, God is the God is to global human and non-human suffering what doctor the doctor is to your pain. So a doctor has two cures in her power. She has a very painful cure and a not very painful cure. Both of them will completely cure you and produce the greater good. So the outcome is the greater good. It's completely to completely cure you of what ails you. But one of them is, is very painful in getting that outcome and one is not painful at all. So now, if the doctor gave you the first one, you wouldn't think that that doctor had your best interests in mind or that he was caring or good or powerful. You'd say, well, what the hell? Why didn't you give me the, um, the not painful cure? Why didn't, if it was within your power to make me better without any pain at all, why didn't you do that? Um, wouldn't that have been the better way to achieve this greater good? Um, this second cure would have been optimized, we can say, overall to minimize suffering. So the point here is that it looks like what these examples suggest is that an all-powerful God wouldn't just seek a greater good. He'd seek to achieve them by the best possible the least evil means. God would optimize his solutions in the world. And this is an answer or a principle, an argument that Leibniz is going to be very uh, sympathetic with. Leibniz is going to make this point. Because look, if God knows everything, then God's surely going to find the very best path through all the possible ways in which um, suffering could happen to produce the best outcomes. Okay, so um, here's another way to think about, something to ruminate over, um, another challenge for theodicies. And this requires a bit of background. Um, it's something from statistics and probability. It's called the multiplication rule. Think about it this way. In general, when we speculate about the possibility that different independent claims are true, the combined probability that they're all true rapidly becomes negligible. And that's because you have to multiply the probabilities. And here's what I mean. If the odds that a person in the phone book, so suppose you just randomly open up the phone book. Um, well, most of us don't are starting to forget what that is. But it used to be you had this big book that had lots of lists of everybody's name and their phone number in it. Yeah, right. Isn't that a weird thing? Um, imagine you just randomly open up the phone book and then point to a name. Now, if the odds that a person in the phone book is a Republican are 0 0.4, 40%, 
And suppose we also know that for that phone book, the odds that a person in it is a woman are 50% or 0.5. Suppose we also know, because of independent survey and investigation, that the odds that people in general um, in the phone book are bricklayers are a mere 3%. There's not very many bricklayers out there. That's a, it's a relatively unusual job. So now what if we ask this question? If I just randomly open up the phone book and point to some name, what are the odds that that person is all three, a female, a Republican, and a bricklayer? And the way you get the answer to that question is you multiply 0.4 times 0.5 times 0.03, which gives us 0.006, or 6%. That's to say it's a 94% chance that the person you just picked is not all three of those things. Now that's how the multiplication rule works. And humans, it turns out, are pretty bad at um, making these kinds of estimations. Um, we ignore the multiplication rule when we make these sort of general off-the-cuff estimations about the likelihood that something's true. Now here's how this applies to philosophy of religion um, problem of suffering uh, context. The combined probability of a complicated theodicy being true has the same problem. That is, if you've got a theodicy that requires a bunch of independent claims be true, then the likelihood that they're all true is going to be a function of multiplying all of those. So what are the odds independently that the free will defense is true? And that's one of the answers we considered a few slides back. And then we ask this other question, what are the odds that God lets natural laws run their course for our character building? And that's uh, Hicks' answer to the problem of evil. And what are the odds that a moral salvation scheme is the best way to achieve divine goals? Somebody might argue that, well, God's going to put us in this world and then um, let us suffer and let us make mistakes and let us fall away from grace. And then God offers us Jesus and this opportunity for moral salvation through um, our changing our behavior and recognizing um, Jesus' sacrifice um, and, and so on and so forth. So lots of Christians, for example, think that, um, and lots of non-Christians, uh, theists also believe that there's some kind of moral salvation scheme that God put in place in the world. Okay, so uh, these are very different sorts of claims, different kinds of answers, different sorts of things that a pastor might say in church in, in response to um, the problem of evil. So consider one, two, and three. So the um, question now becomes, um, what are the odds that all three of those things are true combined. Now, I don't know what the odds of one is and not the odds of two and the odds of three are. That's going to be a sort of subjective estimation. But think of it like the Republican female bricklayer in the example above. Suppose that um, you think the odds of one is true are 50-50 and the odds that two are true are 50-50 and the odds that three are true are 50-50. And what you have to do then is then multiply 0 0.5 times 0 0.5, which is 0 0.25, times 0 0.5 again, which is 0.125. So now we're down to a 12.5% chance that all three of them are together uh, true altogether. So, so you see what I mean? The more complicated, the more... Um, uh, additions, the more additional proposals or the addendums, and the more um, uh, uh, caveats or the more principles that you have to add to one of these stories in order to accommodate the full story. Now think about um, the vast problem of suffering that includes dinosaur pain, for example. Now, now the more of these provisions that you have to add in order to explain the compatibility of God and suffering in the world, the more of these multiplications add up and the more they seem to undermine the overall likelihood that all of them are true. And you see what happens. Now this is not just unique to theodicies. This is unique. This is a problem for lots of combined probability situations where we're reasoning from some position of ignorance and trying to figure out um, project and make some estimation about the probability of multiple things being true when they're independent claims. Okay, so the multiplication rule is a general and important background um, uh, question and concept that we have to keep clear in our minds when we're thinking about philosophy and thinking about making decisions, um, when you're trying to figure out why it is your friend didn't show up for dinner, you know, uh, what are the odds that uh, he was 
uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a combined number of independent things happen to him when he's late for dinner. The, the odds are going to go down. The same, same, thing, same thing works there. Okay, so I just want to keep that in the background and think about it in these contexts of philosophy of religion. Okay, next. So what we've shown now, I think, in summary, is that the existence of suffering appears to be at odds with the existence of God. Now, that's not to say we settled the issue. There's lots of really interesting proposals about how to uh, alleviate or to clear up that, that seeming incompatibility. There are a variety of kinds of suffering to consider, and there's a long history of it. We've seen the ways to label all of those different um, uh, flavors of suffering, if you will. Attempts to reconcile um, the two, God and suffering, are called theodicies. Some of the most sophisticated and plausible responses from philosophers are um, the soul-building response from Hick, God's plan is beyond our comprehension answer from Leibniz, the free will defense from Plantinga, and the atheism response from Rowe. And we're going to consider all of those in much more detail in the following weeks. We've seen that theodicies have a number of challenges to meet. An all-powerful God does not face limitations in achieving his ends. And we've seen how that plays out in terms of lots of the common responses to the problem of evil. And we also need to keep the distinction between possible and probable clear in our thinking about suffering and about God.